Welcome to our um, webinar opportunities and challenges for industrial application. I'm uh, Marta Kinishi from um, Enea. Enea is a partner of uh, Focus uh, COE project uh, that uh, support uh, this uh, webinar. Um, first of all, I, will, I would like to thank uh, to my colleagues Andrea Quintiliani yeah. um, that have uh, worked with me to organize uh, this uh, webinar and uh, also to thanks uh, to the presenter for the availability uh, before um, to start uh, just uh, um, just uh, um, a few highlight items uh, um, just to focus uh, the context uh, of the webinar um, current uh, the HPC um, is uh, became the pivotal of significant advances uh, um, both in uh, scientific uh, field uh, discoveries uh, and uh, also industrial innovation and for this reason the European uh, Union has uh, considered increasing its investment in, in uh, HPC ecosystems, in particular to support the development of a European technology and pursue excellence in the application development. Um, regarding the last objectives, the Horizon 2020 program have supported the creation of 14 centers of excellence for computing application in different and several areas like the environmental science, energies, new materials with scientific challenges motivate the need for new computing resources like the exascale class. And uh, in this context of the COE, is co-located the, the FOCUS um, COE project. Uh, that is an initiative founded to promote the COE technology and services to stakeholders from science and also from industrial with particular focus on small and medium sites uh, um, enterprise and there be reinforced the positive impact of the HPC in all the areas uh, covered uh, um, by the, the COE. In particular, the um, HPC, um, uh, or in particular, the COE members and also Focus founded the, the Council and uh, the platform and the Council HPC3 um, with the main goal to define and joint uh, COE overall strategy and activities to strengthen the rule of application in HPC ecosystem to coordinate the activities and also the services offering of all of the 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 coe um, as i said at the beginning of the introduction this webinar is supported by focus coe in particular um, within the work package three uh, with the that have the, the the scope to develop the interaction between the coe and the industry industry with the aim to increase the impact of the coe on the european industry unfortunately we cannot um, um, uh, organize the face-to-face -face events and that the physical one um, due to the pandemic uh, period and then we shift on the online online mode uh, just uh, some information, uh, just uh, to stress uh, the aim of this uh, webinar. Uh, the aim is uh, to cover some of the most uh, critical research area of the ecosystem of the COE and highlight uh, some topics uh, such as the um, physical mathematical model, numerical algorithm, code, library, and uh, some of the activities uh, that uh, running uh, into the COE um, project. Uh, uh, the target audience for this uh, webinar is uh, to attract uh, the potential industrial stakeholder in order to provide uh, the interaction with, uh, with the COE. Uh, more details uh, about the focus and uh, COE you can find in the focus COE area website um, and just uh, the technical information before before to start um, about uh, the recording the webinar the webinar will be recorded uh, thanks uh, to all the presenter in because uh, uh, give us uh, the okay um, to record their day they talks um, for all the um, participants please uh, send uh, your question during the um, the webinar using the 
go, uh, go to meeting tools uh, in the chat and or oh, feel free to um, provide any question at the end of all the presentation during the discussion um, about the question comments also feedback please uh, after this uh, um, half day of webinar please to send us uh, to me andrea um all uh, of this feedback and um, um we um, come back to you with a survey questionnaire just to uh, have some feedback about this uh, um us day okay the agenda for today just my presentation just to introduce uh, the webinar we have uh, four um, four talks, one from uh, uh, Massimo Celino from Enea, uh, Alfredo Buttari um, from CNRS, um, Jose Gracia uh, from uh, the COE Pop, and in the end, Alison Walker from uh, EOCOE. And the end, uh, um, uh, discussion and just some confusion. Uh, that's we can start. Um, I can. Uh, um, the first speaker is uh, Massimo Celino uh, from Enea. Uh, Massimo, I give to you the control and uh, floor or the virtual floor um, is uh, yours. Here. Hi, Marta. Hi. Good morning, Massimo. Thanks morning. for the first talk. I need to you the you have the control just to share your screen. Just send uh, you yeah. to my microphone and uh, web and, and camera. Can and, you see uh, my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, okay, thanks, Massimo. I need to you the virtual floor. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Marta. <clears throat> uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to show, uh, to discuss uh, the ECHO Center of Excellence, the, the, European, the European Center of Excellence, the European Energy Oriented Center of Excellence in HPC. Uh, my name is Massimo Celino, I work for Enea in Italy. Uh, the, the context in which there is this uh, center of excellence is that we are facing two revolutions. On one side, uh, there is an energy revolution, as you can see in, on the left. Uh, we are still using coal, uranium, petroleum, natural gas, but we have to move urgently and quickly to renewables. So uh, energy from solar, from geothermal, hydro, biomass, and so on and so forth. On the other side, as you can see on the right, there is a revolution in, in the HPC. Uh, now, in the next years, hopefully will be available as a scale uh, supercomputing uh, machines. Uh, they, and there are, in the HPC is undergoing a major change in the next generation of exascale systems because there are several challenges. Uh, for first of all, a reduction in energy consumption. We need the new computing models that are able to use uh, several tens of millions of computing elements. Uh, the machines will be heterogeneous and uh, they will have deep memory hierarchy. So there is a, a big revolution in both hardware and uh, software. And ECHO, uh, we can say that it is at the crossroad of this numerical and uh, energy uh, revolution. Uh, ECHO, briefly, is, uh, um, is based on ECHO2 uh, project funded by the European Commission. Uh, it involves uh, seven uh, countries, 18 partners, uh, 13 research institutes, four universities, and one small medium enterprise. The coordinator is uh, Professor Edouard Audi, uh, de la Maison de la Simulation, uh, CA, in France. Uh, this is a three year project. Uh, we started in the beginning of uh, 2019, and we'll, uh, the project will end. In the, in the end of 2021. Uh, the, the, <clears throat> this ECHO2 project is built on the ECHO1 project experience 
and collaborative network. Uh, the main objectives are briefly that we have to develop uh, energy science breakthrough. It means uh, energy challenges, scientific challenges in the energy field in five key low carbon sectors, wind, meteo, materials, water, fusion. Uh, we have to develop cutting edge computational methods to exploit the next next generation of HPC infrastructures. And uh, we have to develop a co-design uh, software development approach. It means that uh, experts in the software, hardware, and uh, users should be should uh, work together uh, to define uh, the the new codes, the new challenges. And uh, we are trying to build up a sustainable European infrastructure to coordinate the deployment of HPC for energy. Uh, how is uh, structured this uh, the eco project? Uh, it uh, we have a matrix of organizations to meet the scale challenges. We have uh, five energy scientific challenges wind, meteo, materials, water and fusion, and uh, four technical challenges, scalable solvers, programming models, IO, data flow, and ensemble run. Uh, we are tightly linked with the major uh, <coughs> uh, European organization in HPC, PREIS, EuroSPC, and ATP for HPC. And uh, we are collaborating tightly with also with uh, the ERA, that is the European Energy Research Alliance. Uh, some words about ERA because it, this is a very important organization. Uh, is uh, an association, an European association with uh, two, over 200 European public research centers and the university and it involves uh, more than 50,000 researchers. It is organized in 17 joint programs from bioenergy, materials for energy, carbon capture, concentrated solar cell, energy storage. All the topics in energy are, uh, are here. And all these joint programs are uh, communities of uh, working in the energy field, in the research in the energy field. Last year, uh, ERA launched a new transversal joint program uh, called the Digitalization of, for Energy. Uh, it has two sub programs, one uh, for HPC and the other one for data and artificial intelligence. And ECHO is uh, this new joint program is based on the collaboration with the European project. ECHO for HPC and ERA data for fair and open data. So ECHO activities uh, will interact with uh, the other joint programs transversally uh, in the energy field. Uh, in the ECHO project, we identified uh, five flagship codes but uh, we work also on other codes that we call companion codes in uh, wind, meteo, materials, water, and fusion. And as you can see in the, on the right, there is a very, very strong uh, interconnection be among all the uh, partners putting their expertise uh, on both technical and uh, scientific uh, challenges. Um, Okay, uh, uh, we understood some some time ago that uh, we have a very high hand, uh, up to date uh, innovations, scientific results, uh, but uh, it is not enough to to succeed in exploitation, to go to the real user of our innovations. So if indeed, we, we understood that uh, our uh, researchers, the researchers in the ECHO project, uh, me too, 
I'm, uh, this is also for me, that uh, we have a big focus on technical aspects and not on the use of the innovations. Uh, that is always uh, often difficult to do, translate technical specification in relevant information for potential users. And uh, always it's difficult to understand the customer needs. And so to define a clear value proposition for the user, for the customer. The customer can be a company, can be uh, an association like ERA, can be anything. Uh, so uh, we, we tried to have a professional help to overcome this gap between research and uh, exploitation. Uh, we hired uh, a meta company, they are experts in this field, and uh, with their help we were able to define exactly the eco-services, what is useful from eco-innovation for the uh, customers outside the project. So all our services are well characterized. There is a characterization table, a link ambience. Uh, we developed a, an implementation roadmap uh, and there is a pitch to present uh, these uh, innovations to eventual customers outside the, the project. Uh, now, I will give you just some <coughs> uh, clue, some about this uh, innovation. One of them is in the field of material science, but this, this is not the only one. There are uh, others innovation in material science in ECO project. One of them, uh, uh, I think it, it will be presented by Ellison uh, today in the next uh, presentation. Uh, one of them is this one, uh, for example, we are developing a tool for nanoscale optoelectronic device uh, uh, simulations, because uh, the purpose of this tool is the modeling of transport in materials uh, or devices based on nano junctions, semiconductor, heterostructures, nano wires, and 2D uh, materials. Uh, this tool can have a, a very large application because uh, it is possible to design the third generation of solar cells, thermoelectrics, or electronic uh, devices. Uh, this tool is based on uh, a complex uh, workflow that uh, starts from uh, an atomic scale. Uh, in this case, we are speaking about uh, hetero interfaces in photovoltaic devices. Uh, this tool is able, in this workflow, several uh, atomic scale uh, <coughs> samples are uh, developed and uh, characterized. Uh, this is an automatic workflow that uh, analyzes snapshots, all these snapshots, and to compute uh, both physical and chemical pro properties. Uh, for example, project density of states, charge densities, local density of states, electrostatic potential. Uh, this is useful at the atomic scale because uh, we want to have a very accurate uh, characterization of the materials. And then we, then we go further to macro scale uh, properties, uh, useful for the real materials. Uh, so we use uh, uh, libnegf that is used to compute the transport properties of this kind of uh, uh, materials. And uh, we are obtaining very good uh, results because this is a very efficient uh, tool and uh, libnegf uh, is now coupled with one year uh, Novanta uh, numerical codes and uh, it is able to to simulate uh, to scale up uh, to very large <coughs> number of uh, nodes um, another for example another service that uh, we are developing is a SAS portal because we believe that uh, um, 
uh, we need an entry point to all the software that we are developing in ECHO project. And also we, we aim to have, uh, to provide an easy access to high performance computing platforms. Uh, because uh, we see that uh, there is a growing need of SR scale uh, simulations, or at least uh, a large interest on, on this kind of uh, approaches. Uh, so uh, we want to make easy uh, uh, users from uh, university or research labs to conduct energy-oriented simulations and to let them uh, find easily and friendly the software and the platforms. Uh, so uh, this ECOSAS portal, uh, it, it will uh, have uh, ECO certified uh, solutions. It will be a single access point to validate the applications for renewable energy. It will be friendly uh, because uh, you can easily run, run a trials, uh, test, uh, with all the codes that will be implemented. And uh, it will be also managed by PCNC expert. This is uh, the Poland uh, uh, partner, uh, where all the solutions, eco solution, will be collected, implemented in the uh, uh, high performance computing platform available for the project. Uh, just briefly, other two applications, for example, uh, uh, Barcelona Super Supercomputing Center partner developed uh, based on Alia. Uh, it is possible to simulate uh, entire wind farm uh, uh, installations, uh, extended wind farms with inclusion of, uh, of the canopy, the complex terrain, full wind turbines. Uh, with accurate uh, uh, simulations. Uh, then uh, the last one, uh, for example, uh, one of the libraries that are developed in the in the consortium is, is a PSCT toolkit that is a PS Labs uh, and AMG4 PS Blast uh, package. This package provides parallel algebraic multigrid for uh, iterative solution of linear systems. Uh, it can be used on several machines, uh, hybrid or not hybrid, heterogeneous or not heterogeneous uh, platform, GPU uh, included. And uh, this is uh, freely available and uh, you can have more information on this uh, website. Uh, it is developed by the collaboration from Roma Tor Vergata, CNR University of, uh, of Pisa. Uh, so th that's all. Uh, you can keep in touch uh, with us. Uh, we, we have uh, other uh, several um, uh, innovations and services. Uh, you can find more information on the website, on LinkedIn or on YouTube, where we uh, publish our webinars and uh, training materials. And also you can register to our newsletter and you will receive uh, twice uh, per year our uh, newsletter with the news and uh, for the events and the services. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Massimo, for this uh, presentation. Um, could you please um, give me the, the control? Yeah. Sure. And I give uh, the control to the second speaker of today, Alfredo okay. Butteri. Thank you, Marta. Uh, Bye. Hello. Okay, so Hello. I'm share my screen. Uh, I just speak to you the controller, Alfredo. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning and thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you have now the, the control. All right. Um, Ciao, eh, <laughs> sì. Massimo. Can you see my screen? 
Uh, yes. So, uh, sh should we wait for Massimo to mute his microphone or? Yes, uh, maybe I can just send a <laughs> message to him. Right. Maybe now it's okay. Okay, thank you, Alfredo. Please, uh, the floor for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this, this talk is about uh, using low rank approximation techniques for improving, uh, accelerating uh, the uh, solution of uh, sparse linear systems. So before I get started, I would like to give credits to all of these collaborators from academia and from, from industry who contributed uh, to, to this work. So they are so numerous because this is, this is a very broad uh, research activity that has gone uh, on for, for uh, uh, more than, than 10 years. Uh, but the experimental uh, results, uh, results that I'm going to show are uh, very much related to the, to the ECO project and uh, uh, precisely task three, uh, which is devoted to uh, uh, linear algebra. So as I said, the subject of this talk is the solution of linear systems of the type AX equals P. And we are interested in the case where the matrix A is potentially large and uh, sparse. And uh, as you might know, the most commonly used techniques for solving these type of problems can be roughly classified into uh, two very broad families, which are iterative methods and direct methods. Uh, now, iterative methods are well known for being generally scalable and, uh, and efficient, but their efficiency uh, uh, relies, uh, depends on the spectral properties of the matrix A. And in some cases, the, the problem may be so bad and numerically difficult that iterative methods converge very, very slowly or may not converge at all. On the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, direct methods uh, are known for being very uh, robust, which means that they pretty much work on any, any type of uh, problems. But uh, at the same time, they are more expensive, both in terms of um, execution time and memory consumption. So here we are interested in direct methods and we are uh, going to present methods for uh, reducing uh, the cost of these, of these methods. So let me just quickly recap how these methods work. Now direct methods work by factorizing the, the, the problem matrix, uh, for example, using uh, Gaussian elimination. So this is, this is an ADU factorization. Now if you assume that we do not want to take advantage of the fact that the matrix is sparse, uh, the cost of this factorization co uh, is proportional to the cube of the size of the matrix, which is a small n here. But sparse direct methods can take advantage of the sparsity of the, of, the, of the matrix, and they do so by using methods such as nested dissection, which uh, recursively splits the matrix, or the, do the domain where the, where the problem is defined, into smaller and smaller subdomains, which can be handled uh, separately from one another. So this leads us to this graph here, which is a tree graph, and which we call the elimination tree, which is uh, traversed from the bottom to the top. And every time we visit a node, what we do is that we assemble a relatively small dense matrix, which we call a frontal matrix, associated with one of those small subdomains, and we factorize it. And then we go all the way up until the roots of this elimination tree. And it is possible to prove that the complexity of the sparse factorization is equal to n squared, which can be a considerable gain compared to n cube, uh, if you consider uh, that uh, n can be as big as 10 or 100 medium, okay? So, but still, n squared is, uh, is quite expensive, and therefore we are interested in developing techniques for reducing this co complexity even further. And uh, what we are doing here is that we are using low rank approximation techniques. Uh, so let's go back to the case of a dense matrix B or a block and let's assume that we have computed its singular value decomposition and therefore this S matrix here is a diagonal matrix that contains the singular values in decreasing order. And now if we choose a threshold epsilon we can split these singular values in two groups and we put in S1 all the singular values that are larger than epsilon and in S2 all the rest. This allows us to write B as a sum of these two terms and if we drop the second term, what we obtain is a, matrix, is a matrix B tilde, which is an approximation of B of accuracy epsilon. Now, the advantage of doing this is that B tilde is much more compact than B, as you can also see in this figure here. And this means that we are going to 
uh, use uh, much less memory to store B tilde instead of B. And if we use B tilde instead of B in all our computations, we are also going to reduce the complexity of these computations. Now, there are many applications where the singular values of, of B decay very, very fast, for example, e uh, exponentially. And this means that we can obtain very, very accurate approximations, which are at the same time very complex. Now, unfortunately, the matrices that we're working with are not low rank, uh, which means that we cannot compress them right away. But we, uh, instead, we can prove that within those frontal matrices that I showed a couple of slides ago, we can identify blocks, small blocks, uh, which have this low rank property. And this is quite easy to understand because a block essentially represents the interaction between two subdomains of the domain where the problem is defined. And if these two subdomains are far away from each other, they interact weakly. And this translates into the fact that the singular values uh, decay very, very fast. Now, once we know about the existence of these blocks, we need a way to take advantage of them. And one of the techniques that have been proposed in the literature and, and is one of the most well known is the H matrix format, where a matrix, a frontal matrix in our case, is decomposed into, a blo into blocks according to a hierarchical structure. Now, this H matrix format has very nice theoretical properties. For example, we can prove that the factorization of an H matrix can be achieved in, in almost linear uh, complexity. But this hierarchical structure is quite complex uh, to, uh, to handle, especially uh, in, a, in a parallel setting. For this reason, we decided to develop uh, a different approach, which, which we called block flow rank, where the matrix is split into blocks that have all the same size in a, in a checkerboard fashion, like what you can see here uh, on, the, on the right part. Now, this format does not have the same nice theoretical properties of H matrix. I'll talk about that in a minute. But it can be handled much more efficiently, uh, especially uh, in, in, a parallel, in a parallel setting. And therefore, we believe that this will lead to a better compromise in terms of uh, efficiency and, and execution time. Now, we studied the theoretical, the theoretical properties of the block law rank, and, and we proved that the sparse factorization, the complexity of the sparse uh, factorization, when we use block law rank, can be reduced to n power 1.6. Which is, which is a nice gain compared to n squared, especially in the case where n is very, very big. And we developed uh, multiple variants of the block law rank uh, format, and we proved that for the best of these variants, which we call here uh, BLR uh, plus, the complexity can be as low as 1 to the power, power 1.3. Okay? Now, it is also possible to have nice reductions in terms of memory consumption, uh, for example, when using block law rank, the memory consumption is uh, uh, of the order n log n compared to n power 1.3 for the standard uh, full rank uh, solver. So all of this is described in this in this paper here. And we also turned our attention to to the to the use and implementation of block law rank in a fully featured uh, sparse direct solver, which is uh, MAMS in our case. And so what the, the, one of the first problem, uh, problems that we have to tackle was the fact that MAMS is an algebraic solver. Uh, so this, this essentially means that MAMS does not know anything about the geometry of the problem uh, where the problem is, is defined. And therefore, the question that we have to answer is how do we define uh, these block low rank blocks uh, that we can compress? And for this reason, we developed a method which relies on the graph of the sparse matrix instead of the uh, geometry of the domain. And then uh, we developed uh, several block low rank factorization algorithms that can handle uh, pivoting to guarantee the stability of the factorization and, and, and of the solve. We uh, developed parallel uh, methods for both shared and distributed uh, memory uh, parallel machines. And then we uh, also designed uh, uh, methods and operations that can cope with uh, the very small granularity of operations because when we use block law rank, the data is decomposed into small blocks, which are further more compressed. And therefore, the efficiency of operations is lesser and, and we, have to, uh, we have to deal with, with, uh, with this uh, source of inefficiency. So all this work uh, is described in these two papers here. 
Now let's see uh, how uh, these block row rank uh, techniques uh, perform in uh, some applications, and namely here I'm going to focus uh, on applications that are provided by our uh, partners in the in the eco uh, eco project. So the first application is provided by friends from the Alia uh, application that uh, Massimo also Massimo also talked about in the previous presentation. And uh, so Alia uh, is, is this application which is used to design uh, wind farms and also uh, wind uh, turbines. In, in this case, uh, what we are interest, uh, interested in is a structural mechanics problem where we want to design a wind turbine blade. And uh, we are interested in uh, measuring how much pressure this blade can sustain before it breaks. And so these are a few details of the model. Uh, which leads to a problem which has 10 million uh, degrees of freedom. And this is the execution time, so this is only the factorization uh, time, which is the most time-consuming part, uh, measured on 240 cores of the Mare Nostrum machine uh, in, in Barcelona. And this is the standard MAM solver without block low rank uh, and without any specific uh, tuning. So you just go on the MAMS website, you download the, sol the, the, the software and you run it uh, without any specific a particular setting. Now, with some tuning, we can we can uh, reduce uh, this execution time. So, for example, by turning off pivoting, which is apparently not needed here, and by using some more advanced uh, parallelization, multi-threaded parallelization, which will be available in the next month's releases, we can improve the speed of the factorization from 4.5 to 5.4 teraflops per second, which is quite considerable performance on 240 cores. And now let's see what happens when we turn on block low rank. Now the execution time is roughly divided by two. Now obviously the execution time depends on the thresholds which we have chosen. Here we have different thresholds from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 3. And obviously uh, if we use a larger threshold now the execution time goes down because we are dropping more and more information, which means that we are computing less and less accurate uh, solutions. Now, if we wanted to achieve the same execution time with the standard full rank solver, we would have to use four times uh, as many cores as with block low rank. So the yellow bar shows the execution time of the full rank solver using 960 cores, so four, four times as many. Now, obviously, as I said, because we are using block low rank, we are computing an, uh, an approximate uh, solution. So how good is this solution? This is showed by the red dots in this figure. Uh, obviously, for the full rank case, the solution is very, very accurate. Uh, the, the, the backward error is of the order 10 to the minus 15, which is what you might expect when you do double precision computations. And then when we use block low rank, what we can see is that the backward error is pretty much of the same order as the uh, as the block low rank uh, block low rank uh, threshold, which means that uh, we can very very reliably control the accuracy of the solution by using these uh, block low rank thresholds uh, epsilon. Now. There are two possible uses of the block low rank feature. One use is as a direct solver. So this means that, for example, I choose uh, a, a uh, an epsilon threshold which is 10 to the minus uh, 10 to the minus 6 for example and this will give me a solution of pretty much the same order and if I am happy with this solution I can use it right away but I can also choose a very very large threshold for example 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 1 and in this case I cannot use the directly the solution because because it is not accurate enough but maybe I can use the resulting factorization as a preconditioner for an iterative method, or as a solver for a course, uh, for the course grid in a multi-grid method, as, uh, uh, as in this case here. So as you might know, uh, multi-grid methods work uh, using different grids of decreasing uh, resolution. And in all the grids, except the last one, the problem is uh, very, very approximately solved using smoothers, like for example gauss seidel But on the last level, we need more accuracy, we need more robustness, and therefore, on the last level, we use a full sol uh, solver. And uh, we are interested in using uh, MAMS with block low rank on the 
on the course level, on this last level here, and compare it with the case where we use an iterative, preconditioned iterative, iterative method like uh, p min res. And we did this uh, analysis and this work um, uh, in, a, in the context of a, uh, an application, uh, which is a mantle convection simulation application, which relies on Navier-Stokes equations, like what you can see here in this, in this slide. And we performed a weak scalability analysis, uh, which means that uh, we produced three problems of increasing size. And for each problem, we chose a number of cores in such a way that the number of degrees of freedoms per core is pretty much constant. Now we implemented this in a multi-grid solver, which is called hierarchical hybrid grids. It's a geometric multi-grid solver. And for this study, we used uh, six levels and uh, V-cycle uh, with uh, Uzawa uh, smoother. And on the course level, we used either MAMS with and without block low rank or uh, uh, preconditioned mean res. Now let's see the experimental results. So here you have three groups of bars, one for each problem, but maybe we can just focus on, on the larger problem here, which is a very huge problem, which has uh, 100, 100 billion uh, unknowns. So the first bar is uh, um, related to the case where we use p min res on the course on the course level. So the blue part shows the execution time, the time spent on uh, on the fine uh, grids, so that means levels from one to five. And the yellow part shows the time spent on the course level, so this is level six. And as you can see, uh, we spent a quite considerable fraction of, of the total execution time on the course level, and this is because this is a numerically difficult problem, and therefore p min res has a hard time to achieve uh, a sufficiently accurate solution. So we want to reduce this time here. And therefore, we decided to try uh, MAMS. So first, we tried the, the baseline MAMS, uh, like the full rank uh, MAMS, without block flow rank factorization, uh, block flow rank approximations. What we can see is that now there is a setup time that appears, and this, time, this, this corresponds to the time needed for factorizing the, the problem matrix. But once this factorization is computed, the time spent on the course grid is very, very small, because we only have to do uh, uh, forward elimination and backward substitutions, uh, which are very, very cheap. But still, this factorization time is, is quite, uh, is quite uh, large, so we want to reduce this. And this is why we decided to turn on uh, block low rank approximations. Uh, uh, here we chose a threshold of 10 to the minus 5. Now, as you can see, the setup time is considerably reduced, but at the same time, the uh, time spent on the course grid is not increased, and this is because a threshold of 10 to the minus 5 is good enough not to degrade the overall performance of the multi-grid method. And now because we chose a threshold of 10 to the minus 5, it doesn't really make much sense to use double precision computations on the course grid, and therefore we can switch to single precision computations, and this allows us to uh, further reduce uh, the execution time both in the setup and uh, on the course grid level. And of course now uh, the, the question which is left to answer is how do we reduce all the blue part? And maybe one idea that we can try to pursue is to reduce the number of levels and to find a good compromise between the complexity of the course level and the time spent of all the fine, uh, uh, the fine levels. All right, so now I think I'm just gonna skip uh, these conclusions because this is simply a resume of everything that I've uh, just said. And I want to finish my talk uh, uh, by uh, thanking you all for uh, your attention and thanking Marta for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. And uh, I'm ready to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alfredo. Maybe at the end of all the presentation or maybe after some, uh, someone uh, sent to you some uh, an email. Okay, okay. Uh, could you please uh, give me the controller and uh, I give the controller to next uh, uh, talk, next uh, presenter, Jose, gracias. Okay, thanks. Jose, can you? 
I hope that pronounce uh, well your name and surname. Good morning. Yes, yes, good morning. <laughs> um, okay, good morning. Now you are the, um, the relator and I have the controller for share your screen. Yeah, I have to change something here. Just a second. I need to give permissions to this application. Grazia uh, comes from a POP uh, um, project, is uh, another COE project, and today present some uh, performance analysis as a service uh, came in from uh, the COE um, project. Can you hear me, Marta? Uh, yes, but um, I cannot you... see your screen. No, no, uh, I don't have uh, the rights yet. I cannot see your screen, so maybe you have to give ah, me okay. the presenter again. Okay, okay, when you want. Yes, go ahead. Now, the problem is that it's asking me now for permissions to go to a meeting, and when I give permissions, then I have to restart go to meeting uh -huh. um okay and sorry for you that have, it's the first time i use go to right to, to jose marta presentation no, i think the problem is on my side because uh go to meeting is asking my operating system for permissions to share the screen ah uh, okay uh, I give to him uh, the controller that I cannot. Uh... Um, yes, I think it works now. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes. now, yes. yes no, it's okay. Maybe just uh, to switch uh, off the other. Okay. So. Okay, uh, sorry for that. Uh, the first time I used this go to meeting and the Mac operating system is a little bit picky with access rights. So my name is Jose Gracia. I'm going to present a project pop from a perspective as a service um, to an industry customer. So we do actually services. And the slides are mainly due to Fusan Husseini from the Numeric Algorithm group, group. And I thank her a lot for that. So, um, the goals of the project are basically two. First of all, we want to promote best practices in prior programming, in particular in high performance computing, um, because well, everybody depends on compute time. And if we increase the efficiency of our codes, everybody will win. And for that, uh, we develop a POP methodology for performance analysis. And that is uh, one of our main um, outcomes of the project. And maybe most relevant in this context is that we actually offer free services to European academic and industrial code owners and users. And we basically have two service levels. Everybody can come to us and uh, get those services. And one is uh, we do a performance analysis and performance assessments of your code. And uh, we will give you recommendations and suggestions how you can improve your code. And the other service level that we have is we actually help you implementing those recommendations. And not all of them, not to the full extent, but we do kind of a proof of concept of those uh, implement of those optimizations. And when I say we, um, we are a team of, um, I think it's eight partners now, that's uh, BSC in Barcelona, Terratech in France, um, the Supercomputing Center of the Czech Republic, uh, two supercomputing centers in Germany, Jülich and HLRS, the Numerical Algorithm Group in the UK, uh, the University of Versailles in France, and the uh, Technical University Aachen. Together, we have excellence in performance models uh, and tuning, 
and performance and performance analysis tools and uh, application tuning. And also we have excellence in developing programming models uh, and best practices. So we are active members of the MPI standardization body and the OpenMP standardization body. And all of us, we have a significant uh, research and development background in with real academic and industrial codes. There's various ways to get in contact with us. Uh, most importantly, our website. Um, but you, it's also very nice to have a look at our YouTube channel. We have a lot of webinars, a lot of technical um, documentation as videos. Feel free to look at them. So um, the premise, the starting point of our project is that performance analysis is really hard to understand for most people. You can do traditional scalability plots like here. You plot the performance or the speed up over the number of compute nodes, get a curve like that. From that, you will know that your application is not scaling ideal, but you don't learn very much. You can use various tools like it's plotted here, um, Cubes, Galaska, and Paraver x to do analysis of your codes. Uh, but there's a wealth of information, very much details. And for most people, this is very difficult to understand and interpret if you're not uh, trained in these things. And in most cases, they will give you not a very quantitative um, description of the real performance characteristics of your application. Over the years, um, the people that later became POP have developed a solution for that, or we think it's a solution. We have a system of performance analysis metrics. And, and the idea is that this performance metric should be easy to get from trace data, should not be too complex to get those metrics. And these metrics should indicate specific causes for poor parallel performance of your codes. Um, and these metrics later on, we think it's also a good way to um, be like a common language and common ground for discussion of performance issues between developers and users uh, of the code. So these pop metrics, and um, we have several systems of them. Here's the classical one for MPI. Um, it's a hierarchy of metrics. So there's a top level metric which we call global efficiency. This overall describes how well your, power, your code uh, scales um, when it's um, the power code scales. And this global efficiency is decomposed, is the product actually of two metrics, one which we call parallel efficiency. And this describes how much time you're actually wasting in parallel libraries such as MPI or OpenMP. And the other contribution to scaling a global efficiency is computational scaling, uh, which measures, me measures if you decompose your problem across different processes, how much actual, how much additional computation do you have to do? Um, so this would be, for example, related to the classical uh, Amdahl scalability. It's not exactly Amdahl, uh, but it's related to that. And those parametrics, they decompose again into submetrics. Um, for example, let's continue here with computation scal uh, scaling. If we are spent doing more computation, it can be done because I actually do more instructions. So that would be instruction scaling. Or I do the same number of instructions, but I do them less efficiently. This would be IPC scaling. Or nowadays, it can also happen that actually the frequency of your CPU varies if you scale. Um, and then that would be frequency scaling. And similarly, we can decompose parallel efficiency into something that is that we call communication efficiency. This is the true cost of communication. And something that we call that is load balance. So if you have different amount of work across your processes, in most parallel programming models, this will look like it's spending additional time in MPI. Um, but it's not really a communication cost, it's just a load imbalance. And again, communication costs, we can decompose into transfer efficiency and civilization and things like that. So we have a hierarchy of metrics and they ultimately point to fundamental problems in your application. And if you look at them in detail, these pop metrics, actually they are relatively easy to calculate. So if you have a trace, you just need the total execution time of your application. You need to be able to distinguish between computation time and not computation time, for example, MPI or OpenMP. 
And if you can do that, then you will be able to calculate the the maximum computing time of all processes and the average computing time of all processes. And with those three numbers, you can actually calculate almost all the metrics already. And um, if in addition, you get the total number of cycles, CPU cycles, and the total number of instructions of your application, um, then you will be able to calculate the scalability metrics as well. And finally, if you have the total execution time on an ideal network, so this is a kind of estimate, then you will be able to decompose all the parallel efficiency metrics as well. And the tools that we developed as in POP, they can do this. Uh, so we have for all tools now, we have uh, special plugins that will calculate those POP matrices for you. And speaking of tools, in the consortium, we develop uh, at least four tools for this uh, work. Um, this is Extra and Paraver, or actually four families of tools. It's Extra and Paraver from BSC, um, SCORP and Scalaska um, from Uli Supercomputing Center, Macau is a tool for a single core performance analysis from the University of Versailles, and PyPOP is something that we've developed in the last few years. This is a um, Python script to show you nicely the, um, the performance metrics from any traces. And further information of these metrics you can find here. Sorry, that's my wife. <laughs> so let's look at an example. This is a molecular dynamics application. Uh, the code is C++, um, Fortran, and NPI. And let's suppose we don't have access to the source code. Um, other methodologies assume that you actually look at the source code of your, uh, to do performance analysis. Typically, you would start with a scaling curve like here on the right side. And you can see that starting at, let's say, eight cores, the scaling curve flattens, but you don't really know what. Next thing you can do is you can start extra and paraver and you get timeline traces like this thing down there. But again, if you don't know how to navigate this, you don't know how to use the tool, this gives you very little uh, insight. And there's nothing that I, as an analyst, can really discuss with you. So uh, as I said, we calculate this pop matrix. Here are the pop matrix for this particular case. And this is a table. Each column will be a different number of cores. Sorry. So ranging from 2 to 40 cores. And then each row will be uh, one of the metrics and we've arranged them here in the same hierarchy. Green colors means value is good. Value should be between uh, zero and one. And if they are higher, they are good. Red values are bad. Um, so in this example, I see that, first of all, global efficiency gets very bad if you get 40 cores. Um, why is that? Global efficiency, we know, is the product of parallel efficiency, which is 68%, and computerized scaling, which is 53%. Um, so let's continue looking at computational scaling because it's the worst value. And then I see that computational scaling is bad because instruction scaling is bad. That means that your application, if you parallelize it, actually does more instruction than if you run at low number of cores, for example, because it's doing extra work uh, on the boundary conditions or because there's parts in your code that are not yet parallelized, that, that is uh, work that you repeat. So I can already tell the user, um, look at your uh, domain decomposition, for example, and see why you do additional um, amounts of computation. Okay, let's go back to parallel efficiency. This is the second row. Parallel efficiency is the product of load balance and computational efficiency. In this case, communication efficiency is quite good and load balance is bad. It's only 80%. So I can tell my customer again, um, look at how you decompose your problem across MPI ranks. It doesn't seem to be balanced. Uh, there are some ranks that do more work than others. And then in the next iteration, we can do another uh, tracing of the application and concentrate on specific parts of that and try to tell the customer which part of his application actually have this load balance issue or um, computational scaling issue. Okay, that's one example. 
Um, let's skip this. I'm a little bit short on time already, I think. Um, the other example is um, a code from Computer Fluid Dynamics. This code is Fortran and OpenMP. So our methodology is not limited to MPI. It's we can apply it to almost every programming model. Um, our tools are prepared to apply this to MPI, OpenMP. There are also a little bit of CUDA now and two hybrid models, so it means combination of those. In this code, um, this is again the matrix. The global efficiency, for example, is very bad at 45 uh, threads in this case. Um, and if we look down the matrix further, we see that the combination scaling is bad, 48%. But in this case, the instruction scaling is perfect, it's 100%. So we're not doing more instructions in this case, but we're still spending more time on calculations as we increase the amount of uh, threads. And that is in this case, due to the case that IPC scaling goes down. So we do instructions less efficiently. We do less instructions per cycle. <clears throat> um, so the user has to look why his loops, for example, get less efficient if you uh, parallelize them, if you decompose them with uh, opening P4 um, constructs. Um, that's one reason for the bad performance of the thing. And the other is the OpenP region efficiency. Um, and if I understand this correctly, OpenMP region efficiency tells you, so in every OpenMP region, you have a little bit of overhead setting up this region and tearing down this region again. And that causes a lot of uh, inefficiency here. So probably you have too many OpenMP regions. You spend too much time setting them up and tearing them down. And one approach would be maybe to combine OpenMP regions here in this code so that you don't have the additional overhead so much. Um, so even without looking at the code, we can already tell the user in the direction where you would have to look at. Uh, in this example, we did actually another thing. We went to the second um, service level we have, the proof of concept. So the user gave us the code after the initial analysis and asked us if we can help him fixing the performance issues. And this slide is a comparison of the modif of the code before doing the proof of concept on the left side. So this is the table that we just saw basically. Um, and then we went there and modified the code. And for example, we improved here the OpenMP region efficiency it was 60% before, and now we improved it to 78%. If you improve the OpenMP region efficiency, you will immediately improve the parallel efficiency as well. And also we worked on the IPC scaling. It was very bad at 36%, now it's 56. <clears throat> this increases the computational scaling um, automatically. And overall, both of them contribute to increasing the global efficiency. So the code before our um, optimization was working at 15% global efficiency. Now it's working at 37. Still not good, but much better than before. So this is an example where we not only do the performance analysis, but we also help the client to implement the modification in his code. <clears throat> uh, here is a more traditional view of the performance. So the original code is in blue. On the right side, you see the speed up curve. And you immediately see that the speed up now is much better with the modified code in red. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so we have done a lot of services. And this slide is not totally current. So we've done more than 350 services since 2015. Uh, so Pop is in the second round already. Um, we have customers from all areas, from engineering, earth and atmospheric science, physics, biology, genetics, um, really from all areas. We try to encourage our customers to help us write success stories and to publish them on our website. And some of them are just listed here. So in some cases we get three times speed up improvement, either because we do the implementations, the optimization, or because we suggest optimizations to the customers. 
Um, here we have two times. Um, here's a tenfold scalability, scalability improvement. So you could scale out a factor 10 larger than before and things like that. Obviously, not every service results in a factor of, for example, six like here. Sometimes we just have improvements of a couple of percent. Um, but in many cases, the customers are already happy with that. Um, if your application is good from the very start, then there's nothing. You cannot even improve it by a factor of 10, but only a few percent. <clears throat> and here's a view of our, um, let's say, customers. Or, so it's true that most of our customers are from the engineering um, area, 30%. Uh, we have many from physics. Um, we have some from other areas and this is changing all the time but this is just to illustrate that it's not just the classic engineering application that come to us and also we look at all kind of codes some code of them are free some are just uh, proprietary codes and we are also prepared under non-disclosure agreements and we can sign those it's not a problem we work with um, medium and large industries as well and a little bit of more statistics here. We can also work with, for example, Python codes now. Uh, it's not a problem. Um, we have a little bit of support in the tools now for Java, though this is not really working. It's, it's still a lot of manual work for us, um, but we see that necessity and go a little bit in this direction. In terms of program models, most of our codes are still MPI or MPI with uh, OpenMP. And we're seeing more and more codes that use accelerators. And some codes also use newer program models like Intel threading building blocks and things like that. Okay, in terms of online content, if you just want to see what we do and learn from us, we have a lot of training materials where go to our website. Um, if you want to work with us, if you want to have us look at your code, go to the site uh, slash services. There, there's a small form that you have to fill out and to get in touch with us. We have blogs, we have learning materials, a regular a newsletter. Um, we also have a YouTube channel that actually publishes uh, webinars that we've done in the last four or five years. Uh, and like call them podcasts. This is small webinars on small specified topics. Um, we also give training now it's online training courses um one medium to do that is our webinars but in principle we can also arrange training sessions with you or with your project uh, or with your company and show us our methodology works show us and uh, show you how uh, our tools work and things like that okay so to summarize um prop we have developed a uh, performance metrics hierarchy. This gives us a quantitative picture of, of your application behavior. Um, we have metrics for classical MPI, OpenMP, and hybrid codes. Um, POP as a project and a methodology works across application domains, across platforms, across scales. There's not no limit to that. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, go to this uh, services website and there ask for HLRS if you want to work with me or my team. Otherwise, this will be assigned to another team in POP. And as a center of excellences, our goal is to promote best practices in product programming. We want to encourage a systematic approach to performance analysis and optimization. Um, and we also hope to contribute to investment in training of HPC experts. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Hey, thank you, Rosa. Thanks for this presentation. Um, I, I want to, um, if you are in question, we encourage you to ask them via chat or the participant to webinar. And please write in, uh, in the chat using the um, GoToMeeting tool. And thanks again to Jose. And um, just to uh, give the control to uh, Alison. Okay. Uh, so I I'm going to. Hi, Marta. I'm uh, just going to see if I can share my s s 
uh, screen and um, let's see if I just can. I, have, I think I'm going to have the same exactly the same problem as um, as Jose. So I just uh, <laughs> need to uh, run. Um, yes, I just add that. Okay. Yes. 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 Sorry. I said, bear, bear, bear with me. Um, I couldn't do it earlier because I didn't want to interrupt the, the meeting. Yeah, now you have the control, maybe. Right, it's, it's, it's just, it's exactly the same that problem that Jose had, but it's my operating system, it's a security yeah. feature. So now let me see if that now works. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, excuse me. Um, I to confirm everything it was offering me. <laughs> so, uh, I, again, I, so I. Okay, so now perhaps it will work this time. Yes, yes. Okay, I just have to restart the GoTo meeting now. Yeah. Um, right. Um, so, yes, okay, good. Right. Can you, um, it says, t tells me to wait. Yes, now. Yes, yeah. good, perfect. Yes. Uh, with yes, the uh, I know that I have some problem with the booking meeting. <laughs> yes, that, 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 that's, oh, well, that, that's okay. That, that, they're all, that, all the platforms are different and they all have their own special peculiarities. <laughs> Um, let me just um, start my show. Right. Okay, okay good. So you should you. be able to see it now. So good. So let me just move the panel over. Right. Okay. So um, the I, I'm glad to, uh, I'd like to, Marta, thank you very much for organizing this really nice webinar. Um, I, I personally think it's really important with um, industry and, and small and medium sized enterprises. Um, so this is um, this talk is is a particular aspect of an interaction we have with um, an SME called Material X. Um, and I've given the um, website link to this firm on this slide. Uh, and so this um, this talk is based on um, the uh, on links I established with a project I coordinated called Xmos, which finished in, at the end of June 2019. Um, and uh, in that project in Xmos, uh, Otello Rossioni was one of the postdocs, and we've established this collaboration for um, commercializing um, Otello's code. Um, to look at um, particularly organic semiconductors. So um, I'll just um, talk about the firm and our own interaction, that's the University of Bath, with uh, this firm Material X. So what they, uh, I'll go into the software that they provide and why it's really topical and quite, shall we say, very new. Um, there's been recent reviews which have appeared even within the last two days. Um, but they basically provide software to understand um, how organic molecules pack together and how to deduce from that the um, charge transport. So our interaction with the firm is to test their software um, in the following areas in organic conductors in energy materials. I'll come back to what organic conductors have to do with energy materials. In multi-scale models and in um, a mesoscale model, which I think is um, underestimated and understudied um, in terms of its impact on understanding um, these new materials, these new organic materials. So what the firm Material X provides is software for molecular modeling as a service. And they also provide consultancy on material science using a combination of molecular dynamics and electronic structure methods 
because that's how people in the organic semiconductor world think and so they show how we can deliver new organic materials and new applications using these techniques of molecular dynamics and electronic structure. Um, the point is what the USP is, is um, the ability to deliver molecular morphology, that's how the molecules pack together, which is as accurate as traditional all atom models, but at a fraction of the computational cost. And so I've um, given the, um, the link there. I think in interest of time, I'll, um, uh, I'll move on in, but uh, we can, you, you can find the, the, the for information about the firm on the website. So why are, what has energy materials got to do with organic conductors or vice versa? Um, well, the main area of application is organic solar cells, which have recently achieved something of a renaissance. Organic solar cells have been around for, uh, since the start of the 21st century. Um, and uh, firms like Heliotech have really been able to, to, to sell the, the things, make uh, sell organic solar cells um, based on these organic conductors. But it's fair to say that they, um, there was a bit of a lull in activity because they weren't, they, the organic conductors are, 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 organic materials are fairly poor conductors. Um, and uh, so they lead to the, the solar cells, which for a long time were only 12% efficient. But in the last few years, the efficiencies increased to 17%, which then starts to make them uh, viable competitive with the proskite solar cell. And the point about organic solar cells is that you can make semi-transparent solar cells. So you can you, you can make a plastic film to put on a, on a window. So it, it can be used for, for um, built-in photovoltaics. Another major application, which is really looking promising is the internet of things, because you can use organic solar cells for indoor um, applications because you can design the molecules in these organic semiconductors um, to absorb at different um, wavelengths of the illumination spectrum. But also you need to be able to model organic uh, conductors um, in the new kid on the block, which is the perovskite solar cell, in which I have a lot of activity, which is part of ECHO, uh, perovskite solar cells um, started at 5% in 2012, and they're now at 30% efficiencies. And uh, every time you go on the internet, there's some more, there's some new article about a world beating efficient uh, perovskite solar cell. Um, but the thing about the perovskite solar cells is that they have charge transport layers and um, at least one of those charge transport layers you know, uses um, organic conductors. So to understand, to make the solar cells, the perovskite cells more efficient, you've got to understand transport through an organic layer. And thirdly, um, an application which um, I think is very promising, but I will say is um, outside my own expertise, is in polymer batteries. Um, and so here the idea is that you're going to use a polymer electrolyte in, in, a, uh, in a battery. And Again, you've got to understand how polymers conduct charges and how the, um, the charges behave in the presence of um, moving ions. And for all that, you need multi-scale modeling. So multi-scale models, this is a, a very familiar um, diagram and anyone who's um, ever been funded by the European Union um, uh, modeling um, calls will be very familiar with this diagram. The point being that you start at the electronic structure level, which is sub nanoscale, so that's um, sub nanometers. Um, that's very well established, widely understood by the chemistry groups who mainly work in organic and perovskite cells. 
Um, you then have to um, develop techniques to understand charge transport at the atomistic level, where we're talking about tens of nanometers. And that's a big leap from conventional electronic structure methods. Um, and then what happens after that is usually people ignore the mesoscale and, and immediately um, go and look at continuum models, which is just standard device models where you represent the material as a homogeneous, um, as a homogeneous uh, whole. And then you can use very standard um, device models to, to, to look at this continuum level. But the problem with the continuum models is you need an awful lot of parameters to, to get them to work. And just fitting them to experiment is not really, um, is not very, if, is not really helpful because you do only fit to the experiment. The fit is only as good as the range for which to, of the experiment, the range of temperatures, illumination levels, and so on um, to which you're fitting. So you really want to understand these materials to understand how you can choose an organic semiconductor that's going to produce your, your solar cell um, with the efficiency that you want. You've got to, um, you've got to start from the um, sub nanoscale level um, and use, um, uh, understand the basic physics at that level to, to develop the parameters you need for your continuum model. So that brings me on to the mesoscale where you have to um, coarse grain your models. In other words, you turn your atoms into beads. There's, um, yesterday, I found um, a very nice review, which has only just appeared in the last two, two or three days, um, which describes all the physics of this coarse graining very, very beautifully. And in fact, cites the, the work of Material X. So I'm going to talk. I'm now going to focus the rest of the talk on these coarse grain models, which are what are being um, commercialized by Material X. So first of all, why do you need to know um, what about the morphology of organic semiconductors? What's that got to do with organic solar cells? And the answer is that in organic semiconductors, their packing determines the charge transport. So you've got to have three um, modules within your code to predict the efficiency of a solar cell. And the, and the core model is a, a charge transport model. And we've developed such a model um, and we're developing it further in ECHO2. Um, and it's based on the kinetic Monte Carlo method. And the beauty of the kinetic Monte Carlo method, which I developed some years ago, is that you can use it to look at interactions between charges, localized charges with excitons, um, and uh, you can look at the effects of recombination at this coarse grained level. And what's really cute is um, William Saunders, who was employed by ECHO2, um, he developed uh, a fast multipole solver, which means we can handle the electrostatics exactly, but very, very quickly and it's designed for exascale applications. Um, so that's the transport model, but because the, um, the charges are very localized in organic materials, they have to hop between the um, molecules and the hopping rates are extremely sensitive to how the molecules pack. So you can calculate the hopping rates with um, a standard atomistic electronic structure methods, which are well known in organic semiconductors. Um, and you can use the same electronic structure methods to calculate the morphologies, um, which are then coarse grained. And that's what Material X does, looks at the coarse grained morphologies. So we ourselves um, uh, did some research um, as part of XMOS in uh, morphology simulation. And this shows you um, with a bit of clever coarse graining, the slide shows you just how big the systems are you can look at. And this um, slide, which shows um, polymer P3HT, um, a, a solar cell which has um, PCBM um, fullerene acceptors, and it shows how the two pack together um, at this um, 20, uh, sort of getting on for, well, it's 12 nanometer cube box. And <laughs> that is big enough to understand the charge transport in these polymer solar cells. But 
this it was it was a very clever technique was developed by my graduate student Alex Smith and and my postdoc Ian Thompson, and Otello developed a similar method. We were always in touch about these two methods, um, and they have done something similar, but I think but much better defined. They've worked on it for longer, but they got this really lovely method where you can calculate at the atomistic level. Um, the, what the packing is, you then coarse grain it, and you've got a one-to-one -one relationship between the atomistic and the coarse grain simulations. So if I can, I'll see if that works. Um, so Okay, so um, that um, hotel voice, you can hear that, and it's it's rather nice exposition of, of, of the idea behind the, the code. So I want to now move on because life time is getting sh short. Uh, so um, so this is quite technical, and I and it 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 summarizes what was shown in that little video um, that I produced um, that I linked to. Um, but basically, you can you have this link between atomistic level calculations and these coarse grain level calculations which is essential uh, hang on sorry let me just um uh, let me just <laughs> let me just stop that okay um so just go back to the presentation right okay so what I want to do now is to just say that we validated, we helped Otello validate his model against our Samson approach, and we've shown that we produce the radial distribution functions which characterize the morphologies and show how the packing, that gets to grips with the physics underpinning the packing. So um, Otello uh, Material X have um, looked at polymers. I've given some references here. And um, so you can even look, use their method to look at uh, uh, biological applications, such as a, a chromosome. Um, I'm more interested, particularly from the point of view of organic solar cells, is understanding charge transport in polymers, and that's described in this uh, reference by, by Otello and his uh, and colleagues from, from, other, from Exmos. So um, the other thing you can do with this um, type of approaches, you can look at interfaces between organic semiconductors, which is absolutely essential if you want to understand um, uh, stacked um, organic um, solar, solar cells, what we sometimes call tandem cells. So now I'm going to finish because I think I've used up my time. Um, Material X offers software for molecular modeling as a service. Its model um, delivers molecular morphology which is as accurate as traditional all atom models, but at a fraction of the computational cost. And our role at Bath is to test their model and to apply the morphologies in our kinetic Monte Carlo method so we can simulate um, organic solar cells and the, charge trans the organic charge transport layers in a perovskite cell. So I'd like to, to thank you for your um, attention. 
Uh, thank you, Alison, for your presentation. Please, could you? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just see if I can get the. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me just. Um, uh, I just need the button. Here we go. Uh, so bear with me. Um, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so if I just switch switch off. Um, yes. Uh, there, there we go. Good. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, thanks all the speaker um, today. Uh, we have finished uh, with the presentation. I don't know if uh, someone uh, want to ask uh, and have uh, any question for the um, presenter today. If yes, please uh, would you switch on the, the microphone? Or maybe is it the coffee break time? <laughs> okay, we are waiting, or you can just write in the chat. Um, okay, um, that's all. Thank you, everyone, for coming in this. Um, in this uh, webinar um, just to remember that is a, a webinar supported by focus coe uh, project european project um, i want to also to uh, thanks uh, to all the presenter today for the avail availability and also to teratech uh, to manage the, um, the tool and uh, technical um, uh, um, tools for, for uh, today. Um, I want just to stress uh, for something stakeholder in the um, presenter today, just to keep in touch with us uh, and uh, for all to send uh, feedback, uh, uh, any comments uh, and also um, information. If you need to me and Andrea, uh, I think that you, um, I have a share my screen with um, our uh, email and uh, also please check the area of the focus COE, you know, because in the area you can find all the information regarding the code, uh, the, um, the, the, the algorithm and the services provided by the COE. Today is just an overview of something that EOCOE and POP that um, COE have, the activities. And um, I want to encourage to all to send the, um, uh, the question. And uh, I don't know if Andrea to want to add something or, or not. I don't think to, that we have a um, um, uh, question. Just uh, can I suggest to everyone to turn your own camera if you need so that we can take uh, um, a group picture if, uh, if you can. I don't know. Ah uh, yes, uh, I'll just I have a um, see something in the in the chat, but I have some problem to read now. I was asking if you're going to share the link. Ah, uh, yes, I don't know, worry. Ah, okay, just yeah, yeah, I can send the the registration. Yes, we have recorded the session, and we are going to share the link.